On March 22, 2021, a lone gunman opened fire in a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado, resulting in 10 casualties. In the following days, politicians gave the usual response to such incidents, tweeting out thoughts and prayers to the families of those affected. Following the crisis, the United States House of Representatives actually took action to do something about this crisis. The House approved H.R. 8, a measure to institute universal background checks by a margin of 240 to 190. Background checks have consistently been a highly popular policy, pulling at over 90% approval for many years. So it's no surprise that, in the wake of a gun violence tragedy, the House would pass a popular solution to solving gun violence. What is surprising is what followed. After H.R.A. passed the House, it was sent to the Senate. At the time, the Senate was in a 50-50 partisan deadlock. 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans. Democratic politicians typically support background checks, and Republican politicians typically oppose them. So we may expect the bill to fail. However, there were several Republican senators who supported the legislation, including Susan Collins, Pat Tomey, and Lindsey Graham. So in this instance, there was actually a majority of senators who supported passing the bill. So you would imagine the bill would have passed. But that's not what happened. The bill failed. Since then, there have been hundreds more mass shootings in the US, even though background checks have a massive majority of public support, supermajority support in the House, and majority in the Senate, they can't become law. To understand why this happens, let's take a closer look at how the Senate works. The Senate was formed in 1787 by the US Constitution as a compromise between two factions of the early American government, large states and small states. Large states wanted each state to be represented in the government based on population. In other words, large states would have more congressional representation, and small states would have less. This would obviously give larger states more power. Small states wanted each state to be represented in government equally. In other words, regardless of how many people lived in a state, each state would get the same set number of congressional representatives. This would obviously give smaller states disproportionate power. The two factions decided to compromise and create a bicameral, two-chambered legislator. The two chambers became the U.S. House and U.S. Senate. Each state is awarded House seats in accordance to its overall population. Today, the ratio works out to about one representative per 750,000 Americans. So for example, Texas has a population of around 30 million people, so they have 38 U.S. representatives. Vermont has a population of around 650,000, so they have only one. Each state is also awarded Senate seats, but instead of being representative, each state has exactly two senators, regardless of population. So even though Texas has almost 50 times more residents than Vermont, they both have two senators. Flash forward to today, and this bicameral structure often presents major problems to passing legislation. All spending bills have to be proposed in the House, and if passed, still have to go through the Senate before reaching the President's desk. To show why this process can be a problem, let's look at a hypothetical. Let's say there's a law that 70% of Americans want passed and 30% of Americans don't want passed. However, the 30% that oppose the law are concentrated in smaller, rural states. This law wouldn't have much of an issue passing the House, but because of the way the Senate is set up, an overwhelmingly popular law like this is likely to fail because these smaller, rural states are overrepresented in the Senate. And we don't even really need to use a hypothetical to illustrate this point, because it happens all the time. Bills with overwhelming public support will often pass the House and die in the Senate for exactly this reason. But it gets even more difficult. Say there was a law that passed the House and got to the Senate, and a majority of senators supported it. You would think this would be sufficient to turn the bill into law, but that's where the filibuster comes in. To understand the filibuster, I think it's useful to think of the Senate as a game and the Constitution as the rulebook of that game. Of course at the start, senators, the ones playing the game, will look at the rulebook and try to score without violating any rules, but over time, as happens in all games, smart players will identify loopholes. This is what allows the filibuster to happen. According to the Constitution, the Senate cannot vote on a piece of legislation until debate has concluded. In theory, this sounds like a good thing. But in the early 1800s, senators realized they could indefinitely hold up legislation by giving unnecessarily long speeches and preventing a vote from ever taking place. If there was a bill that 80 senators supported and 20 opposed, the 20 senators could each give six-hour speeches in a rotation, extending the debate forever so the vote was never cast. During World War I, this changed, when a group of isolationist senators attempted to use the filibuster to prevent a military funding bill. President Wilson pressured the Senate into adopting a rule change known as cloture. That made it so if two-thirds of senators agreed that debate was over, the Senate could proceed to a vote. The threshold for cloture was later changed to three-fifths of the Senate, or 60 senators. 
The introduction of cloture made it possible to pass legislation that had at least 60 senators supporting it. But over time, as the Senate has become partisanly gridlocked, the minority party has consistently used the filibuster to block legislation that falls short of 60. So even if a bill has 59 senators supporting it, it's likely doomed. This form of obstruction became even easier in the 1970s when the Senate adopted the two-track system, a rule change that allowed the Senate to shelve a bill that was being filibustered and move on to other legislation, allowing senators to filibuster legislation without even having to give speeches. Since it's incredibly rare for Democrats or Republicans to hold 60 seats in the Senate, it's highly unlikely in our current political climate that any members of the opposing party will work with the majority party on legislative priorities. It's very difficult for the Senate to pass anything. Even when a party has 60 votes, a single defector can tank legislation that would otherwise pass. For example, Barack Obama often gets criticized by the left wing for failing to include a public option in Affordable Health Care Act of 2010. The foundation of this criticism is that when the ACA passed, the Democrats held 60 seats. Notably, this was the last time either party had a supermajority of 60 seats. What happened was that one Democratic caucus senator, Joe Lieberman, threatened to join a Republican filibuster if the public option was included, forcing the party to drop the provision. The difficulty of passing bills through the Senate has forced both parties to use different, often less democratic tools to enact their agendas. For example, the last three administrations have all relied heavily on executive actions. Executive actions are written orders by the president that direct the administration to operate in certain ways and the vagueness around their limits has often been constitutionally questioned. But since the Senate is unable to pass priorities like immigration reform, for example, both Trump and Obama used executive actions to try to alter the immigration policy of the US. The gridlock of the Senate has also given more power to the Supreme Court. In the last 10 years, landmark policy like the legislation of gay marriage and the overturning of Roe v. Wade have not been achieved by elected representatives, but by decisions of the unelected Supreme Court. The failure of the American Senate to do their job of representing the people has created a power vacuum filled by more authoritarian elements of government. Now some of you might be thinking, what about the Trump tax cuts? What about the Inflation Reduction Act? Those bills passed the Senate, and neither party had 60 seats. How did that happen? And while that is true, there is still one mechanism in the Senate that allows for legislation to pass with a simple majority vote. Budget reconciliation. Once a year, the Senate can pass a bill with a simple 51 majority vote that makes changes to the budget. However, these bills are very limited and can only apply to changes that directly deal with government taxation and spending. The scope of this legislation is often highly constrained and it's generally accepted that major shifts in government programs or laws that don't affect the budget could not pass through reconciliation. So for example, when Vice President Harris talks about codifying a national right to abortion through legislation, if Democrats do not have 60 votes, this would definitely fail. When President Trump talks about building a southern border wall, if Republicans don't have 60 votes, this would also fail. This should not be how our system works, so what can be done about it? To summarize, right now, the Senate gives undue power to smaller states. After the 2020 Senate elections, the Senate was split 50-50, despite Democrats representing almost 50 million more Americans. This means that the majority party will often be required to win more than 60% of total votes cast for the Senate to control only 51 seats. And even if they have this simple majority, the other party can endlessly filibuster legislation. For one party to get to 60 votes could require they win more than 70% of total votes cast. And in the absence of this, no legislation can pass, except in an annual budget bill that is severely limited. This obstructs popular legislation and incentivizes presidents to use undemocratic vehicles to pursue their agendas. Something needs to change. In recent years, there have been calls from the far left to full-on abolish the Senate. I think there is a lot of merit to this idea, due to its inherently undemocratic nature, but it will never come about. For this to occur, either two-thirds of the House and Senate would need to approve this, which would require the Senate to abolish themselves, or two-thirds of the state legislature would need to approve this, which would require small states to voluntarily diminish their congressional representation. This is never going to happen. Centrists often call for less partisanship in the Senate and for more collaboration on bills. I think this is a great idea, but I don't really see this happening in our current political climate either. The best solution right now is to abolish the filibuster. The great thing is, abolition only requires a simple majority. During the Obama administration, the Democratic Senate abolished the filibuster for judicial appointments, allowing lower court judges to be seated with 51 vote approval. During the Trump administration, the Republican Senate abolished the filibuster for Supreme Court appointments. There is clearly bipartisan support for the idea of filibuster abolition. 
What needs to happen is for the Senate to go all the way and eliminate the filibuster for legislation. This will lead to good and bad legislation, undoubtedly, but what it will do is allow the American people to be more effectively represented in Congress.